But it isn't my fault. I was given those beans. You persuaded me to trade away my cow for beans. And without those beans, there'd have been no stalk to get up to the giant in the first place. Wait a minute. <sighs> Once upon a time. Oh my god, hey! Welcome to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're seeing my face for the first time, my name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. And there are few things I am more obsessed with than Stephen Sondheim and James Lapine's Into the Woods. I am a stagey content creator and an independent theatre critic based here in the UK, and I review shows over this side of the Atlantic. I talk about theatre, news and gossip and rumours happening worldwide. I react to stuff. It's just a generally very stagey place. If that sounds like the kind of thing that you would like to see more of on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to my channel. So if you've been watching my new weekly vlog series that I've recently come out with, also called Oh My God Hey, then you will already know that I recently made a trip over to Bath to go to the Theatre Royal and see the brand new revival of Into the Woods. Into the Woods is not produced that often over here, and I've been getting serious FOMO about the incredibly well-cast production that is currently enjoying a lovely run on Broadway, so I had to make the trip over to see it. This is also my number one favourite musical of all time, and I can discuss it at length, which I'm probably going to do today, so you have that to look forward to. But as excited as I've been for this production, it has also been marred in controversy, and it's made it very difficult for me to wholeheartedly support and enjoy it. That is because the rights to direct this production have been held in the UK by Terry Gilliam, who originally was going to direct this production as a revival at the Old Vic in London. Amidst some social media backlash, a group of theatre makers at the Old Vic uh, decided that they did not want for this to take place, and eventually the production ended up being rejected by the Old Vic Theatre and ended up being taken in instead by Theatre Royal Bath. Mr. Gilliam obviously had some choice comments to make about cancel culture, even though his work is still being platformed by a major regional theatre. And while theatre is obviously so important to me, I think it is much more important that I'm honest with you about my convictions and about my beliefs and standing up for what's right in these kind of debates, in these kind of conversations. And I condemn wholeheartedly the ignorant and awful and juvenile and repugnant comments that Gilliam has made at every single turn, at every opportunity. I think it's completely deplorable, and while I'm going to try and do my best to separate my thoughts on this production from my thoughts on him as an individual and his needlessly divisive recent behavior, I do also want for that to be acknowledged. Now, having said all of that, let me tell you about the show. So like I said, I'm an enormous fan of Into the Woods. I have not seen a live production since I first saw it at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre in 2010, I want to say. Over a decade ago, it's the show that made me fall in love with live theatre because that production was so creative and so full of things I didn't know that theatre could be, and it really opened my eyes to the limitless boundaries of live theatrical entertainment. This was a completely different version of the show that had enormous strengths and gaping weaknesses. There was a black hole at the heart of this production and around it, everything on the outside was incredible. It was kind of like eating a cream egg that turns out to be empty. That's an insane metaphor, but it was the first thing that came to mind. It's like a butterless chicken Kiev. You know, the chicken is still fantastic, but it's, it's you're hoping that once you've eaten past the delicious layer of chicken, you will get to something equally fun. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. So I would describe this as a three-star production of the show, and it's for similar reasons that I've articulated in other recent videos of things like Beauty and the Beast and things like Sister Act, where you have a very visually stunning and well put together production where the material still soars because it's so well written, but the heart at the center of the show is what we lose. I'm going to go into much more detail about this, but essentially this is an incredibly well-designed production that in its staging and in the way that it brings certain fairy tale elements to life is so impressive and so visually striking and achieves so much from a stagecraft and a magic perspective, but it seems to gloss over the meaning of its characters and their relationships to each other and the sincerity of certain moments. I feel like the entire heart of the show has been completely lost in the woods. So Into the Woods is no stranger to a high concept staging, and this one sees it reimagined as the inside of this like Victorian toy box. There's a small child that walks through the auditorium onto the stage, starts playing with a toy box. The whole proscenium design has this like black and white 
cardboard cutout effect. It even has some like cut here, tabs. Everything is obviously scaled up and is meant to represent something much smaller that we are seeing on a large scale. She starts playing with the toys. She is joined by a creepy, creepy dude. She asks the audience if they are ready and then the events begin. She seems to be represented within this world by the creepy dude in the top hat whose identity we learn a little more about throughout the course of the show. He is an infill for the traditional narrator character. The curtain rises in this weirdly quiet and awkward moment when they're all just standing there and there's no stunning lighting reveal. They're just sort of gradually and silently revealed. And we come to find out that the world of this show is a scaled up version of this Victorian toy box. Like Milky White is one of those little like pop-up wooden characters with giant googly eyes. There are various set pieces throughout the course of the show, like a giant Heinz baked bean tin that has giant baked beans coming out of it, a giant Easter egg, among others. Lots of very clever uses of scaled up props. It's all very charming and quite whimsical. And this is the kind of thing that Terry Gilliam is known for, you know? It's this very visual style of director. You cannot really fault him on any of the visuals. The way the woods are created, the way that the houses are created, the backdrops that are used. I enjoy all of it very much. The costuming. I like that we have Sylvanian family style fairy tale creatures running through just to occasionally facilitate some scene changes and provide atmosphere. I like this giant clock face that swings down in front of them to represent the passage of time. I like that Jack climbs down off of that clock face for giants in the sky. That made me beam. And when the giant comes in, Oh my gosh. This has to be the best way that any production of Into the Woods has ever realized this moment because when the giant comes in, it is the giant legs of this little baby doll that we have seen at the start of the second act that the child is playing with and the baby doll comes in as the giant, but you see these giant legs being puppeteered. It's incredibly clever. You see the giant foot step onto Rapunzel. That is genius. When the characters go to defeat the giant at the end, they set fire to it and you see this charred doll's head being dragged onto stage. It's morbid and it's brilliant and it's wonderfully dark, which is exactly what you need from the second act of this musical. I did have an issue with the use of projections at the end of the first act because it feels like there are a couple of moments, even though they had been so clever with a lot of the other things that they had realized, a beanstalk growing out of the floor, some flowers that fall from above the stage and plant themselves. I mean, come on, amazing stuff. This giant chicken person that represents the hen that Jack stole from the land of the giant who plucks Milky White to death in this version. Like there's so much goodness. And then it feels like there are a couple of moments that they just didn't know what to do with. So they put in a projection. And that feels lazy when we've been so brilliantly crafty with everything else. We've been so innovative, so creative to just have a projection at the back of the stage for those tricky moments. That felt like a cop out. It was also very saccharine and fairy tale in the first act. And I was like, I need something in the second act to just trash this whole thing and tear it apart and plunge us into darkness. And I was thrilled that that's exactly what happened. At the start of the second act, when the giant begins to loom, we have this entire house set that falls forwards and crashes over the head of the baker. I loved that. Behind it, you see this Disney style curtain that's been torn up the middle. And then we go from there into the desolate woods. It's exactly what the second act of Into the Woods needs to be. It was completely aware of the necessary tonal shift from the first act to the second. However, I've said so many positive things here. How did I end up giving this a three star review? Well, we need to talk about the role of a director in a musical because our director is in charge of very many things. You know, they have a hand in a lot of different creative aspects. When it comes to deciding what will represent a beanstalk and what set pieces will come on when and the visuals of all of this, that is the role of a director. But the role of a director is also to work with the cast and to evoke something from these meaningful and heartfelt moments. And there were so many of them that were just lost because it seemed as though from an outside perspective, obviously I was not in the rehearsal rooms, but this is just what I'm inferring from having seen the end result. It seemed as though the creative team here invested a lot more time and energy in the physical staging of a lot of these songs and these scenes than they did in actually working on the actual emotional intentions of these interactions between characters. Case in point, you have the baker and the baker's wife singing the song It Takes Two. After a lot of arguing in the first act, this is the moment where they finally come together and you see their love for each other. It is not the most exciting number in the show, but it is very important for setting up the show's very powerful ending. 
and probably the key relationship throughout the entire thing. This number is entirely upstaged by Milky White the Cow being objectively hilarious but very distracting and it seems as though they just didn't understand the purpose of this song and they wanted something visual to be going on so that the audience didn't get bored. This is a director who does not trust the material. There were a handful of brilliant James Lapine jokes that were just cut entirely. I have no idea why. And if they weren't cut, Alex Young as the baker's wife seemed to be the only one who understood the comedy style in which they wanted to be delivered. There were other instances where jokes were missed because they were focusing on something else. One of the best lines in the show is in the reprise of Agony in the second act where Rapunzel's prince sings the line, dwarves are very upsetting, but because he's been directed, presumably, to react so much to his brother saying dwarves a second before, dwarves are very upsetting doesn't land because he's just overplayed the previous moment. Nicola Hughes as the witch has one of the best parts in musical theater because of the duality of drama and comedy. And we only really got the drama. Her witch is not particularly funny. All of the lines that Hannah Waddingham and Bernadette Peters and Donna Murphy and the amazing actresses who have played the witch in Into the Woods have found such humor in previously, she just kind of skips over. And I appreciate no one has ever played it as for laughs as Bernadette Peters, at least in the many, many, many versions that I have seen. But it also does not need to be so completely humorless as it became in this version. It was just the very serious witch from next door. And when she's doing a rap about vegetables that contains the line, you should see my nectarines, it kind of implies that she was written to be a comedy character. Also, not to keep upholding the original version as the only correct version of Into the Woods, but when that was worked on by the original creatives, you have to take that as their intentions for this material and the best interpretation of the material. None of the alterations in style or delivery that departed hugely from it really worked in this production as far as I was concerned. The best choices revolved around Milky White as a concept being hilarious in the way that Milky White was brought to the stage in this version, but I will talk about that a little bit more when I talk about the performances. On the other side of the witch's performance, I didn't get enough intensity in the second act. She has this really powerful moment in the second act where everything stops cold for her to sing the witch's lament. This is the world I meant, couldn't you listen? That bit. And she was playing it sad, but I wanted world shattering despair. Like you can either play it like stoic because you're so overwhelmed with grief and rage that it just shuts you down completely and that's how you're going to process it or you can melt down completely. You know, Vanessa Williams and Bernadette Peters did one, Waddingham did the other. I got somewhere between the two with Nicola Hughes and I just feel like they didn't spend enough time dragging the amazing performance I know she is capable of because she is a fantastic actress out of her. I feel like she did not have a strong enough directing team working with her on this characterization. Tonally speaking, everyone seemed to be doing a slightly different version of the show. Alex Young sort of understood the assignment, as the kids would say, and was giving you the more traditional comedy style of the show. The baker opposite her was doing something completely different. Audrey Brisson Cinderella was living in a similarly humorless version of the show that was kind of slightly offbeat. And Gillian Bevan as Jack's mother was also an interesting piece of casting. Now, Gillian Bevan has played the witch before in Into the Woods, and as Jack's mother, she is not really the character actress type that you would expect. Jack's mother is normally played as sort of this broad comedy character, and that is absolutely not what Gillian Bevan brought here. She was just delivering all of her lines quite sincerely. It became more of like this class struggle character rather than getting the laughs that she has written to. And don't get me wrong, these characters can absolutely be played sincerely, but at the same time, the depths of their emotion really weren't being explored. At no point did I understand what Cinderella's perspectives were on anything. She was just kind of slightly confused and dizzy running around the woods. Equally, after the baker's wife is killed and the baker wanders off to a clearing, he just seems slightly mopey about the whole thing. He starts throwing a rope over a tree to actually hang himself. That's incredibly dark, but I was not getting that level of darkness from his performance. And I think that's because he was not a particularly strong singer. And when it came to acting through song and delivering that level of grief and rage that was necessary in his moment when he is singing the song No More, which is an amazing moment in the show from an acting perspective, he just couldn't really access those emotions. Everything around that sequence was also slightly odd because the death of the baker's wife, which should come as an unexpected gut punch, 
just involved her being slowly followed off the stage by the narrator character. Now, he is not the mysterious man. Normally, the narrator and the mysterious man are possibly played by the same person, or if there is a different mysterious man who is not the narrator, then he turns out to be the father of the baker. Here, he wasn't. He was just this grim reaper character who represented the concept of death. So he walks towards Alex Young with a scythe. She slowly walks towards the orchestra pit, tries to hold on to something, and then we have a blackout. It's implied that she fell. When Gilliam has been doing such exciting things, when he can get an actual giant to tread on and squash Rapunzel, can we not kill the baker's wife with something more exciting? Jack says that a tree fell on her per the script. I would like to see a tree actually fall on Alex Young. And I do not mean that personally. I think she's a fantastic actress. I, I apologize if, if she sees this, but I think that would be so much more striking and the audience would actually feel something. That being said, I really loved the way they reworked No More. He arrives at this clearing with a snapped rope over a branch and the mysterious man character, the spectre of death, is sat at the foot of the tree. He reads a letter from the baker's father that I interpret is meant to be some kind of a suicide note, hence the severed rope on the tree. The baker tries to hang himself from the same tree and they sing a song about it. That is a very poignant moment, very well reconfigured, I think. I'm assuming that the baker's father not returning at any point throughout the show is the reason why they cut the line, the baker who had lost both his parents in a mysterious baking accident, which upsets me because that's a great line. Generally, this whole show had me going back and forth with, I love the way they've done that, but that really isn't achieving what it could. And that's why it's upsetting because given a director who could actually elicit the powerful performances that this show needs and the emotional connection to the material that this show needs and trust the material, it would have been unstoppable. This is everything I've ever wanted Into the Woods to look like. I just didn't feel anything. And I don't know many people who love Into the Woods more than I do, so if I'm not feeling something, you have a problem. I acknowledge I am very picky about this show, but the material is so rich, you should be able to make something fantastic from it. So let's talk about the cast for this production. And I do want to talk about everyone and give you a little bit of an overview of their performances. So Julian Bleach plays the mysterious man. He is every bit as creepy as he was in The Grinning Man. He is giving you the same voice he gave you in The Grinning Man. He's very similar to his character in The Grinning Man. But the characterization is very in keeping with the kind of gothic Victorian style Terry Gilliam is going for here. And Julian Bleach's performance is kind of the one that grounds it in that world the most effectively. So I think he's very necessary for us understanding the tone of what it is that Gilliam is trying to foist onto this material. I keep saying Terry Gilliam. I will acknowledge that the show is also co-directed by Leah Hausman. And the incredible designs that I have praised so much are by John Bowsall. Audrey Brisson played Cinderella. She sang it beautifully. She did some lovely pratfalls. I enjoyed the couple of humorous moments that she got to put in, but generally she just wasn't a very happy Cinderella. She didn't smile for much of the show. The way that No One Is Alone was directed left her with the brunt of it. And normally it's a very still moment where she comforts Little Red and the baker does the same for Jack. There was chaos around her at the beginning of the song and I didn't mind that, but I did want it to eventually get to that level of stillness and we never quite achieved the two pairings that you would normally see in No One Is Alone. It just became a group of them as a four waiting to murder a giant while singing No One Is Alone. And I think you kind of have to separate that number out from the action of what they're doing in that scene. Otherwise, it comes across a little oddly when they're trying to comfort each other and sing this beautiful song about togetherness while plotting a death. I've already talked a lot about Nicola Hughes as the witch. I've seen her in a few things. She's an incredible actress. I know she is phenomenally talented. I was so excited for her witch. And this is maybe the role that I'm the most critical of because I think this is some of the best material ever written for any character. The witch is such a fantastic role. There is more she could have done with it. She was impaired, however, by one of the ugliest costumes I've ever seen in my life. They had her in this orange business suit and I got what they were going for. This kind of like witch turned into a slightly modernized HBIC diva type character, power suit, shoulder pad, business lady of the 80s moment, whatever. As if the color was not ugly enough. When she walked past where I was sitting, I saw the material it was made out of and it just upsets me. I am however thrilled to have a woman of color finally cast to play the witch in the UK. I think with this character who has been so ostracized by society and 
this victim of her mother's abuse, basically, because she never really did anything wrong. I could talk about this at length, but I think it resonates very much to have a woman of color playing that role. Russian Stone played the baker. I enjoyed a lot of moments from him. He has to carry an awful lot throughout the show and maintain his lightheartedness. And he has to play a lot of different emotional directions because the baker's focus shifts constantly. I liked his scene work certainly more than his singing. Alex Young played the baker's wife. This was a lovely performance from her in spite of a hideous hairstyle. I got why they went with it. It was just a little bit Bavarian Christmas time, but few people will ever deliver you acting through song like Alex Young. That is why she is so, so good in Sondheim musicals and why her moments in the wood was stunning. Wood, woods, multiple woods. Barney Wilkinson was Jack. I really enjoyed his Giants in the Sky. It was fun getting him to play younger after seeing him recently in Bonnie and Clyde, where he obviously understudied the lead role of Clyde Barrow. He did the angry young man thing in the second act very well, where Jack is full of a lot of anger and resentment. I really, really enjoyed the whole trio of Cinderella's stepsisters and stepmother, more so than I have in any other production. You had Charlotte Giaconelli, you had Jamie Burkett, you had Alexandra Waite Roberts, who I recently saw playing, understudying the role of the stepmother in Angela Webber's Cinderella. So she is no stranger to a Cinderella stepmother character. There were similarities here with that performance, but also differences. I just thought the three of them as a trio were really strong. And when you have casting like that, why wouldn't they be? Nathaniel Campbell and Henry Jenkinson played princes. They were really funny. Lauren Conroy was very funny as Little Red Riding Hood. I like this ongoing trope that if Little Red Riding Hood is not chubby, she needs to have a regional accent. She was Scottish, so you know, that still worked. But she was very charming. She landed her comedy lines. She did the bloodthirsty thing very well. Maria Connelly is how I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that name. She played Rapunzel. She also voiced Cinderella's dead mother, who was a flower in a vase that kind of breathed up and down. We didn't see her because of the multi-rolling. Don't think I didn't notice that was the same actress because it was. We also had Samuel Holmes as the steward. Now, Samuel Holmes has been a scene stealer in many productions for years. He makes a lot of the steward in this one. Like you will never leave Into the Woods talking about the steward, but he was fantastic. I loved his performance. I thought he didn't have that many lines in the show, but he managed to land a lot of big laughs um, just with the occasional hand gesture. Samuel Holmes absolutely understands camp comic timing and that is what this character calls for. I think he could still play a prince and be fantastic. I would love to see him as Cinderella's prince. He can still do that sort of camp foppish thing very, very well. But somehow my standout performer from this entire show was Faith Prendergast as Milky White. It was just fantastic. I mean, the design of the cow goes a very long way but her physicality, it was not unlike meeting a Disney character in the way that they have to be so expressive because they can't change their facial expression because you can't see their face, but just wonderful physicality from Faith Prendergast as the cow. Much as I didn't like the upstaging of the baker and the baker's wife during It Takes Two, the stuff that Faith was doing as Milky White was hilarious. And so I wasn't not enjoying myself. I was just critical of the choice being made. But Milky White, the emerging star of the show, 10 out of 10, no notes, excellent cow. Now there have been plenty of rumors about this production potentially coming to London. I would love for them to take this time to really explore and define the relationships of these characters and try and mine it for some more emotional connection. I think the foundation of the visuals and what they have here is already so strong. I would love to see more heart at the center of this show. I've talked about that being the same issue throughout this video, not because I want to harp on about it, but because it is important. It is so integral that we connect emotionally with this story as an audience. And it's not just something that we enjoy the visuals of. It has to mean something. And while we're at it, burn the witch's orange act two suit. I hate it, it's irredeemable. There is no fixing that outfit. But we need to find the little reasons in things. Why does the witch sing children will listen at the end? And what does that mean in this version of the show where you have a little girl playing with her toy box? Is that still something that she is interpreting? Is she commanding this overall story? The meaning behind all of these choices has to be as strong as the visuals that have been created for the production. But those are some of my thoughts on the show. I'm going to stop myself, otherwise I could honestly speak about this production for hours, but I'm very aware the way I'm articulating my thoughts is in no way as structured as my normal videos because they are just exploding out of me with this passion that I can't quite seem to stifle because I care very much about this material. 
If you saw this production and you have any thoughts about it, please let me know what you thought down in the comments section. Feel free to disagree with me wildly. Theatre is very subjective. I welcome every other interpretation. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my Stager YouTube channel for plenty more content just like this coming very soon. If you really enjoyed today's video, as a reminder, you can give me a super thanks down below or you can go to patreon.com forward slash Mickey Joe Theatre, where you can subscribe to my Patreon, support me as a stage content creator, and gain access to some exclusive photo and video content. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe!